<laughs> but um, but that actually kind of brings me to another part of it because we've talked a lot about this whole like darkness and light thing, but there's also this element of humor. And it's so operational on so many different levels. Part of it is like some of the characters themselves, like Roger Stone, who is out of his ever loving mind, <laughs> clearly. But like, we should hang that one upside down, you with, know. right? I mean, that's the way he sleeps. He has a bad, definitely like a lemur thing happening. Yeah, with the big. But there's something about him that's you know unimpeachably evil, but that has like he seems to be enjoying himself. Oh, yeah. Whereas a lot of the characters, especially these, all they seem miserable themselves. Like in other words, there, there's not a lot of glee in the way that. Kavanaugh certainly comported himself screaming, crying nonsense, or how pissed off they always look, you know, themselves when they're on TV, and that's part of their shtick. But you bring this element with the words as well as with the face, because <laughs> Betsy's face is so priceless, it's crazy eye. But that is, um, that's also very, very funny. And I would just love to have you talk a little bit about how that works for you. Like, is it, are you, are, is it helpful to you yourself to also come up with things that are sort of, you know, funny or is it still really dark or do you feel like humor is part of the bag of, you know, a part of the arsenal or just like, how does that factor into all this, which is really a very serious thing? Yeah, well, well my humor has been weaponized and um, it is, you know, my, my major weapon. Um, as far as the faces, again, this is my late period, so they're a little gooey and a little, a little more caricature than I used to do. You know, like yeah. the, the closest one, I think, um, to, you know, my, my, my actual signature style is President Evil, Stephen Bannon back there. Um, where I really did them up old school style, but I was doing these so fast, and there's so many of them. I mean, there are more. You know, like in the back, there are like 15 more of them that we couldn't fit, you know, we'd have to paint the ceiling black or something. Or maybe it'd be better if we paint the floor and you could walk on them. Oh, I like that. You know, but, but uh, yes, there is a, a element of, you know, like cathartic element to it. I, I you know, I go, hey, hey, hey. There, and with this kind of work, I have to say, and I haven't said this in a, in a long time, but um, there is a he 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 element to it. And without it, I'd be really a terrible person. Like, you know, I mean, it really helps. You know, and, and especially thinking about how they're going to be on the street or something. You know, like, oh, are people going to see him? And he 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 he, it's going to be, you can make him laugh. You know, there, almost, out, almost. Tickle him a little bit, Colette. We got, maybe later, maybe later. Uh, she knows what to do. Um, anyway. <laughs> and, but, yeah, you know, and the language, I mean, the thing about uh, official English or American English language is the most, one of the most complicated languages, most complex languages in the world, and it has so many, so many rules that it breaks all the time. And you don't, you know, like, how do you spell receive again? Like, you know, and all these words that sound the same and mean something completely different. But uh, also it's a little stuffy. But the American people, just regular Americans, are fantastic with the language. And, you know, we talk about colloquial American English, slang, slang, has life to it, you know? It's like taking the American English language, turning it upside down and shaking it for loose change. You know, I mean, country and Western music, uh, the lyricists can do incredible things with the language and are geniuses at it when it's good. When it's good, it's great. Um, rap uses the language, hip hop uses the language, singer songwriters use the language all the time, even though I like instrumental music myself. But that's another thing, Thelonious Monk. But um, <laughs> Thelonious Sphere Monk. Happy birthday, Thelonious, by the way. 101, 101. Hey, yeah. Scott. Still spinning, still spinning. Perfect. Yeah, but anyway, uh, so, and also, like, I'm a New York wise guy, so I grew up with this. 
you know, like, this is the perfect person for me to talk to, you know, because we spit at each other and it works out somehow. It becomes an ocean. Well, it's that Jewish yeah. New York thing where you can both be talking and listening to each other at the same time. It may not come across that way, but that thing but where you can... that's what's happening. Yeah, it's, it's a real thing. And you make, you know, like, more than the sum of its parts. Almost, yeah. I would say, like, three quarters of the texts that I come up with are not a result of me sitting around writing stuff down. But that's what I was going to ask. It's talking to you. It's just the conversation. I was talking to Colette or to Deb or, you know, anybody who's willing to argue with me. <laughs> About anything. Or you hear something out loud and that triggers oh, yeah. the pun. Creative mishearing. Realize, oh, yeah. Oh. Yeah. You know, I, I'm an old hippie. Like, I was an original hippie from, like, walked into the hate in late 1963. I went to every rock concert, every one, you know, from the family dog down at, at Longshoreman's Hall all the way. And so I have a little hearing problem. <laughs> <laughs> Like, I don't listen when people talk to me. Um, that kind of thing. But... <laughs> but I, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Must be something else. You probably know what it is. Maybe you'll tell me later. Um, I won't hear it, but it'll be okay. But uh, as I get older, and uh, you know, I kind of hear creatively. So you say something... And I get it a little different, and we get into a seven-second delay between us, and I say something back, and you go, what? what? <laughs> You're not the person I was talking to. But it's good. It's good. And, I mean, but the thing is, like, when we talk, uh, it, be, it can become more than the sum of its parts. And that's conversation. That's actually having a conversation with somebody, sharing ideas, sharing thoughts, sharing feelings, you know, um, as somebody. Kinda, right, which is yeah. kind of goes back to a little bit of that abstract expressions thing that it, that it attracted. It is, it's improv. It, yeah. There's an improvisational yeah. Yeah. discovery kind of quality to that. So a lot of, because I imagine you with like, a notebook where like, you know, writing all you know, these things down, sort of like a hip hop artist would like, you know, keep rhymes and like, you know, but that's not what, that's not really what it's like. They sort of, it's much more organic than that. You're yeah, saying. it's very organic. But the, the other thing is, as I get older, like I get a little more forgetful. So we say something great and I'm going, I gotta remember that. I gotta remember. And then I get home, I go, I, gotta, I don't remember that. You know, and it's gone, man. You know, like it happened. It's like music, like, you know, okay. So you can record music and stuff, but if you're live music, it's in the air. It, it literally, David, goes into your body, right? Like if you're listening to a symphony or if you're listening to Dave Shred or something, you know, that hurts. Love hurts. And uh, it gets in, it literally, not just figuratively, literally, the sound waves get into you. And conversationally, the ideas get into me. And then I gotta find them, you know, like, <laughs> where is it? So I, I do have this iPhone and I do write down stuff, like something good that I heard or you said or that we came up with, but I miss a lot of stuff. And, uh, but there is no other way better than having a, a real conversation with somebody, you know? And uh, that's, that's the way staph infection came out and, <laughs> you know. That sounded weird. <laughs> <laughs> Real conversation. That's how the staph infection thing happened. Yeah. Wait a minute, no. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, you yeah, just rub yeah. up against each other and stuff happens. Yeah, right, exactly. Yeah, um, yeah I mean, do you ever, um, okay, so uh, do you ever sort of get, uh, do you get like fan fiction? Like do people send you stuff they want from you, hey, like you Robbie, should, you should do this. Yeah, or I thought no. of something, and I just want to tell you because I love you. Not even like telling you what to do, but just like, you know, that's why I said it more like fan fiction than requests. Like people who sort of like yes. are inspired. You get people that have stuff. ideas. Or any that's a, that's a wonderful thing, you know. Like I hope you all have ideas, and I hope that we can think together about stuff, you know, and talk about it. And you're gonna get to you better fucking ask questions because I'm not here. Yeah. You know. We're like two minutes away from that question asking because the last thing I just want to make sure we talked about is 
um, how because we're all and we are all very focused on resisting the situation with the current. I like to say regime rather than administration. <laughs> you mean the Mad That's King? I like that. I like you know. I don't like to use the word. I like euphemisms. <laughs> Forty five, Orange Menace, whatever. Rather than you know saying it. However, it is such rich pun territory from a writing point of view because of the fact that it with a small t, it's a it's a verb and a noun and an adjective in our regular what used to be our regular language. So, I kind of get, you know, the appearances of that, but also more of that like I've got Bill Clinton looking at me from back there and he <laughs> looks like super sad because he really was at that time super sad and Brett Kavanaugh wrote those questions that made him sad and now Brett Kavanaugh's on the court and that's fine but along the way sad sad bad very bad must change but along the way beer you you have taken you have taken substandard liberals to task as well I mean I remember there was taste like chicken and the other white meat with gore because we had the luxury of criticizing our allies at that time. In donation, sense. donation. Um, the Clintons have made frequent mm. appearances in different ways, and so you know, I just the last kind of question I wanted to ask before we let everyone else in on it was just: um, Has your position on that? Shifted, or is it, or like, do you find yourself in wanting to take sort of our team to task anymore, or is that just like not even on the table right now? Right now, I'm a little distracted. Yeah. Uh, the great Chucky Weiss, who was Tom Weiss, Tom Waits is right hand man for a long time and a real LA hipster. Chucky's in love. Chucky's in love, Ricky Lee, yeah. Um, he made a great record. Eight, like 20 years ago, maybe. And he didn't make another record for 18 years. And I heard a, an interview with him uh, on you know, FM radio, and the guy said, so Chucky, you, know, you made this great record and now you have a new one. How come it took you 18 years you know, to do another one? He said, I got distracted. <laughs> <laughs> and... <laughs> I'm a little distracted by these people. Right. And uh, I've, I painted more this year than I painted any other year in the last 20 years. And I didn't mean to. It just, like, yeah, I was compelled to. You're prolific. It's, I mean, yeah, that's a lot. My late period. Yeah. <laughs> yes, your late period. Yeah. Better, better with age. Um, okay, question, and then it'll be everyone's Thank question. You. Um, of course. Tell me your name. Yes, my name is Jeff Newman, and I'm from the Lower East Side. Good enough. <laughs> Very good. Thank you for all your work. Uh, my question is layered. So your mantra, which I love, do that, apply that which you do the best to that which you care about the most. Yes. Right? All right? Simple thing. We have millennials and Gen Z, and I don't know what the rest of the alphabet that's supposed to be layered. They're in the process of that double helix between what they do best, which they don't quite know yet, and what they care about most, which they don't quite know yet. Yeah, so I'm going to... Is that a question? No, no. It's, the, yeah. it's a layer. Oh, it's a layer. It's a layer. There, there's a question coming short. Yeah. Oh, oh, good. So in your evolution, <laughs> you, you moved and jumped in 32 years ago into the mix. The kids are starting to do that a lot earlier. Yeah. My question is, the streets. So we have the actual physical streets and the virtual streets. Talk about the interplay between that in regard to my preamble, in regard to jumping in, in regard to what you're seeing with young people and how they are recognizing what they're compelled to do much earlier than we were. Yeah, that's, thank goodness. Um, well, that's my generation. Uh, I do very well with people from about seven years old to 26 years old, then I get a little annoying <laughs> because people have stuff to do. <laughs> they have jobs and you know. Oh, Robbie, yeah, okay. Keep talking, I'll be right back. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, but, yeah, they're taking over the streets. I mean, uh, uh, Shepard and Ferry and I are, 
have had conversations about the difference between putting stuff up on the streets and doing stuff on the internet. Or even putting stuff up on the streets illegally and doing stuff that is sanctioned on the streets. Mm -hmm. Or even uh, putting stuff on the streets and putting the same stuff in a gallery and how different it is. It's completely different, same stuff. Some of these things are on posters, but it's a completely different experience, you know. Uh, but to your question, um, and I think Deb and I were talking about this, just coming down from Los Osos, um, there are more people who are fine artists, really like, you know, uh, celebrated professionals who their whole career have not made art about, it wasn't their subject to make art about social and political issues. They're doing it now. Uh, and uh, they're doing really good stuff. And more, but the kids, I mean, you, you remember this, I mean, like Al's Bar, okay? Yeah, yeah. You know, every uh -huh. time I do a poster in the 80s, that'd be the first, you know, after Venice, do Homeboy, you know, West Side. Uh, after that, we go the down. Parking lot of canters. Yeah, oh, yeah. That's right. <laughs> right. And then we'd go, then we'd go down, you know, yeah. go down to Al's and Traction and all that stuff, uh, where our funky people were, and there wasn't much, you know. Now there are tour buses going down there to to see uh, the street art murals, you know, and those are not done by old dudes. You know, there's some of them, you know, but every, I know a lot of street artists and almost every one of them I met, like on the streets at 2.30 in the morning with them jumping out and going, hey little dude, you're going over my shit. And then they go, oh, oh, you're little the old guy. Does, oh, hey baby. <laughs> uh, and then they break my ribs, you know, like, don't hurt me, you know, like I love you too, you know. But, uh, the kids are so prolific, you know, and, and street artists, I mean, shepherd on down, you know, it doesn't matter, you know, like, any of them, they make way more art than I do. This is the most art I've made in a long time. It would take them, a, like, a week, you know, and they'd get it out there. So I'm very grateful for that, you know. And now, like, uh, Mirror One was here for the opening, and uh, Ali was here, um, and a bunch of street artists were here, and they came in, and they go, they see me, and they go, Papa Smurf, Grandpa, get a chair. <laughs> you know, the party's starting, you know, like. And I, I'm, you know, like, I'm their OG, which would mean original gangster, but to them, to us, it means old guy. <laughs> and I am, officially grandpa and I'm grateful you know like so that's an answer anyway come on come on yeah all right so you're mentioning currently that you're in the late period right now yeah. um that would mean that there's been a lot of periods and a lot of growth throughout your art I'm wondering what your favorite period if you can pick one would be of my own yes of your own work. I know it's like picking your own child or your favorite child out of like three or four or five. And that's hard. <laughs> but if there was um, a piece or a period that spoke to you the most or where you felt the most. Well, there are uh, significant pieces that, uh, you know, it's kind of like this is art history. You know, it's like history painting. Um, so, like, if you're doing a social history, a social cultural history of the 80s, you know, well, if I'm writing it, I'm gonna include me. And, and um, if I were to include me, I would include, bye Dave. Bye Dave. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I, would, I would say Contradiction, the Ronald Reagan painting. Yeah. Uh, and poster is very significant. Uh, in, in, yeah, 1988 was a big year for me. Um, and uh, yeah, Jesse Helms' Artificial Artificial, for those of you yeah, who are interested in culture wars, which we have again. Yes. Um, 
Contra Cocaine is uh, a painting that I did and met Debbie doing. So that's like the most important. See, again, like <laughs> punctuation is so important. Yeah. In a sense. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and spitting. <laughs> But yeah, those were, I mean, yeah, it, it, sort of like now, that was, there was a lot of material. Yeah, and I think Bully Culprit qualifies. Yeah, I think Bully Culprit, you know, that's, that's definitely like a, a favorite. I guess everyone sort of has a favorite. Well, right? I can only hope that, you know, at least of the people who like them, maybe they have a favorite. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. I have that one. You have it, good. Yeah. Exactly. So, um, as you well know, I get to wake up with this man every morning, and um, Deb, Deb, um, Deb is she's cool with it. She's yeah, cool. Deb's with it. Cool. <laughs> so um, I, I have Robbie's um, '90s decades painting, and what's so interesting is, and we shared this in conversation in a given week. We had in the painting, of course, yeah. is Cosby and Clarence Thomas and Anita Hill. Yeah. And so, wow. in a given week, what went down? <laughs> um, One day. It was it Very was insane. Good, yeah. yeah. And yeah. it was so prescient of you. I mean, to well, like, you have it in I the bedroom, so I have it in the bedroom. <laughs> it's the only wall big enough. <laughs> yeah. I don't know how you do it. <laughs> Those masks, those masks have been... <laughs> just, just to talk about pressure and a painting that of Robbers and we own. Um, we own a painting that actually gives a line to that you started with right because you actually started with the Nixon. Yes. And we have a painting with words that's seeing red. Yes. Oh, yeah. And, oh, uh, yeah. and, it has, and there's it's floating heads, yeah. oddly enough. Icon is icons, really. And one is McCarthy. Joseph, tail gunner Joe, yeah. and one is Richard Nixon, and one I used to have to explain who he was to everybody floating up in the corner, <laughs> and it's Roy Cohn. Uh, and wow. Roy Cohn was floating over this picture as he floats over that one. Yes, and he's also floating in the back room. Yeah. yeah. Can we get that up? I get you, okay. Yeah. Because I had to do them. And I would yeah. say we cherish it, but the they first place it went was right in front of our front door when we came in. Yeah. And after about three days, I had to move it because I could not read those people. <laughs> yeah, well, most people on my work have it in the toilet. <laughs> Just to force people to deal with it, yeah. and, but also to give them some privacy while yeah, they're Yeah, yeah, you want to have a private relationship. Maybe that's so funny, Roy Cohn, because that is probably who Roger Stone prays to on the daily basis. Please, the ghost of Roy Cohn, you know. Not only, that, Cohn? not only that, but Stephen Miller is the spawn of Roy Cohn. <laughs> yeah. And Baby Gerbils. was the kind of lawyer that... That Trump, Trump, oh, he, Trump, was Trump was Trump's lawyer. He's the standard. Right, he's the standard. When he couldn't get Jeff Sessions to do what he wanted, he basically said, where's, 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 where's my right, 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 right. right. So all of that, and the, I mean, in this one, you know, there's a whole thing. It's you just know, a little named after chilling. a Jewish gangster, Mickey Cohen, and like, just yeah. whatever, it's all there. <laughs> and it's just, and I think that's part of what I was getting at. Oh yeah, there he is. The original Swamp Thing. Was this this year? Yeah. So, and you want to talk a little bit about Roy Cohn, maybe? We just did, okay. while you were, yeah. I really don't want to talk about it. <laughs> but, but, yeah, but what, all, what you all said is right. <laughs> but it's exactly what he just said. Like, you don't, ha you, all, you don't have to explain who Roy Cohn was anymore. You could maybe, you had a minute where you could be like, he was the bad guy in Angels in America. But now, everybody just knows exactly who he is. Yeah, there is Angels in America, which is one of the greatest American plays ever. But that, I had to like go, who was Roy Cohn? I learned it from, from that. I didn't know going into Angels. So there's that thing where these people are coming back around or they seem like they're younger, but then you find out who their thesis advisor was. <laughs> it's like, okay, right? So, yeah, I mean, it's, it really is very, I guess, prescient or it's something. But one thing that has come out of you being so dogged and sort of sticking with it is that we're all getting a look at what the, that family tree, that sort of lineage yeah. looks like. Like these people don't just come out of nowhere. Yeah, you know, now they're out in the open. They're I the mean, prodigies. Of the, let yeah. me just say that um, 
for you to really understand, because you throw around the word prescient, and that's nice, but not exactly true in my case, because my father was blacklisted by the McCarthy Committee. Oh, and uh, he was, yeah, and so you're talking about the early 1950s. I was a little kid, and uh, the FBI would come to our door every morning for a week, and it was classic, it was like, Two six foot tall guys in trench coats and fedoras, perfect jaws like this. And you can imagine you're an FBI agent and you're thinking, I'm doing good work keeping America safe, and I got to go to this guy's house at eight in the morning. And not only that, so they would, I had a script. I, ever, I had a script that my parents told me what to say because they were completely open with me about everything, thank goodness. And they would, these guys would come every morning and say, where's your dad? And I'd say, he's at work. Well, he was out of work for 10 years because <laughs> McCarthy, he wasn't at work. He was under the bed somewhere. <laughs> and they said, where's your mom? And said, she's at work. I said, oh, okay. Well, we'll walk you to school. So for a week in 1952, I had these two FBI agents on the Upper West Side, Upper Left Side, <laughs> You know this, Leo? Walking me to school, telling me that I was the safest kid in the neighborhood because they had my back. Wow. And uh, they did. <laughs> but, but you poor guys, you know, when you think about it. About, but this is why, you know, I knew all about Roy Cohn. I knew all about Joseph McCarthy. We watched, it was family viewing watching the McCarthy you know, army hearings. I mean, we were cheering. We had, you know, glitter signs <laughs> in, in the bedroom. <laughs> It's interesting, Robbie, I, I grew up on the same left side. Yeah. Um, my parents were from Europe, and basically my father was very close friends with Max Weber, who was a painter and yep. at the time. And I, they didn't, because they were in America before the Holocaust and lost everybody, my mother's view of life was to not talk about anything. Right, that's the other so thing. So I knew nothing, but I knew that when those people were on TV, my parents were petrified. Yeah. And Weber told my father one day, you need to stay away from me because my phones are tapped, they're watching right. me, and you were in the Communist Party, we were a teenager, so just, <coughs> and that friendship virtually separated, didn't end. But yeah, yeah, that's so tragic. very little, and I, I, I love hearing you talk because you were the complete other version of that. Yeah, I've had many experiences with what they call red diaper babies, which I was one. Uh, that's children of American communists. Um, and there, you know, there are thousands and thousands, of course, uh, not, not a unique experience, just like my mother's from Warsaw, her whole family was wiped out. And she just, it's a long story, but she just got lucky. Um, but, you know, the whole New York City public school system was decimated by McCarthyism and the Red Scare. Uh, but aside from that, all around the country, thousands and thousands of people. Um, and different people handled that with their children in different ways. And some did not go well. Like I had a date with a girl when I went to Brooklyn College for 23 minutes. Uh, <laughs> didn't work out, but uh, the date worked out, but um, I, I went an hour on the subway from the Upper West Side to Brooklyn to pick her up, and uh, she's getting dressed, getting ready, and I saw her mother was in the kitchen. She said, oh, are you Barney Canal's son? Because my father was like this uh, union organizer guy, and uh, I said, yeah. She said, oh, would you tell Barney and Gretel, my mom, uh, that uh, Sally and Inga say hi, but we haven't told Margie anything about any of this, so please don't talk to her about it. And I'm going like, this is a beautiful girl, this is our first date. I'm going like, what the hell is going on? <laughs> and uh, when I finished the date, which went well, and I didn't say anything, I woke my dad up, you know, and he's going, what? And I go, dad, I was on a date, great, glad for you, you know. <laughs> no, no. And I told him this story and said, okay, Rabala. And he told me, you know, just what you said. Just exactly what you said. That people handle it differently. People handle it differently. And it, but it's a tremendous problem. I mean, it's a problem now. That, like, you know, Trump is terrorizing people. And his people are terrorizing people. 
Yeah, and I think that's a that's a serious thing, and I think that's just like one more aspect of what art like this can do, and why even though. I love seeing the original paintings so that we always remember that you're a painter. <laughs> the dissemination of them, I think one of the other functions it has is to sort of galvanize and embolden, but also just to let people know, like, there's more of us out here. There's yeah. the people who made this. There's people who put this up on these electrical boxes. Like, the we are out here. And maybe, you know, it's, 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 uh, and the internet helps with that, but it was not necessary, you know, in the eighties, it still attracted people, people found you. And I think that, um, that's another, in all seriousness, a uh, function that could be happening now where, you know, the first person does it and you go, oh yeah. And, and there's a little bit, not that you're like a, you know, I mean, I, I guess there's a little bit of a labor leader aspect to the dynamic oh, where yeah. you're putting yourself at risk, partly to inspire others to be brave and follow what they already believe. Well, it's it's, it's uh, to not be to not be afraid to say it out loud. There is something to that, and um, one of the most gratifying and surprising things that happened to me when I was doing the Reagan administration, and people still come up to me sometimes and scare the hell out of me, you know, like at Whole Foods or something, tap, tap, tap. You're Robbie, right? Yeah. Yeah, me. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then they say, well, you know, I grew up with your art, and we thought, that, you know, Ronald Reagan was a Teflon president. Uh, nothing touched him. A lot of the way a lot of people think that nothing touches Trump no matter what he does. I happen to think that's not true. Uh, but... Uh, Ronald Reagan could get away with a lot. He's an actor. He was this. He was that. Um, and people said to me, would say to me, you know, when we saw um, the contradiction poster, we realized we weren't alone. And that's the way I feel with you guys, you know, and and with our people. Thousands and thousands of people have helped us. And people see the posters whether they want to or not. If we do our work right. And uh, it's not for nothing. Love I, and solidarity. Love and solidarity, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Robbie and Shana. Thank you very much. Oh my God, thank you.